We're in Psalm 30 and Psalm 31. Let's begin reading together here in Psalm 30 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 12, and uh, we'll get into our study this evening. Psalm 30, beginning at verse 1 and reading to verse 12. This is a psalm uh, of David, and he says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you have healed me. O Lord, you have brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, in my prosperity, I said I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to the Lord. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will, you, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Now, as we look at this particular psalm, a psalm of praise, I want you to notice that he begins in verse 1 with praise and he concludes at verse 12 with thankfulness to God. It's a psalm of praise. I will extol you. The word extol means to exalt or to praise. I will exalt you, I will praise you, and I will give thanks to you forever is basically how this psalm is looked at. Now, as we look at this psalm, we have to ask the question, why is David praising and why is he thanking God in the manner that he is? Well, he gives to us various reasons as to why he would be thanking God, but he especially is praising the Lord because God has lifted him up and brought his soul up from the grave. Now, I want you to notice that, and I'm going to spend a couple of moments, moments developing something with you tonight. In verse 1, I want you to see this, and I'm going to share a couple of thoughts with you. He says, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. You have lifted me up. O Lord, I cry to you. You have healed me. You have brought my soul up from the grave. Now, when he says you have lifted me up, you have lifted up, Lift it up. It speaks of, of dropping a bucket into a well and bringing the water from that well up to the surface. So what he's saying here is you have reached down and you have rescued me, you have brought me up from a near-death experience. Now, this is going to take a moment to develop, but perhaps some of you may have begun to notice what I have been noticing in the Psalms. It seems to me that quite often psalmists will praise God for letting them continue to live. And the question has to be asked, why is he rejoicing that he has remained alive? Doesn't he want to go to heaven? I mean, a New Testament saint more than likely would be saying, I'm ready to go. You know, this earth is not my home. I'm just passing through. Why do I want to remain here? Now, somebody here might say, well, I like it here pretty good. I'm not too anxious to go to heaven. You know what? I, I think that as you grow older, you'll get more and more anxious to go to heaven. You know, and heaven is a real place, isn't it? I mean, heaven is the home that has been prepared for us by Jesus Christ. It's a guaranteed place for us because He paid the price fully, and we by faith have received His gift, His freedom uh, to go into the kingdom of God through faith in Him. And, and of course, I look forward to to going to heaven. And also, as I read the Psalms with New Testament eyes, I can't help but begin to wonder, did the psalmist not desire to go to heaven? Why do so many psalmists say, thank you for letting me live? And we'll look at that for just a moment. And we need to get its context so that we can understand it. We need to remember that Israel existed amongst pagan people, a pagan people who had absolutely no hope for heaven. And the pagans that surrounded Israel had gods of every variety. They had gods of the earth, gods of the sky. They had gods of the water. They had God over death. They had various gods that they would worship. 
Now, in opposition to this pantheism, in opposition to this polytheism, Israel worshipped the one God who was in control of everything. And this one God that the nation of Israel worshipped had a covenant with the nation of Israel. And God had stated in His promises to them a variety of things, including that He said to them, I will give you long life and I will give you prosperity. That is part of His covenantal relationship with the nation of Israel. I will give you long life and I am going to bless you. Now that's going to be a visible mark of God's presence in the nation of Israel in contrast to the nations that surrounded them. The nation of Israel had a God who promised to bless them. In Leviticus, in chapter 18, verse 5, God said, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. In Isaiah 55, verse 3, God says to the nation of Israel, Incline your ear and come to me here, and your soul shall live. So God had made promises to the nation of Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 9, keep the words of this covenant, do them that you may prosper in all that you do. And so when David is crying out saying, I thank you that you have lifted me up. I thank you that you have brought my soul up from the grave. It's not that David is afraid to die. It's not that he didn't have a hope to be with God in the future. It's that he knew that God delivering him was actually bringing glory to the God that he served because that was a visible testimony to the pagans surrounding him that the God of Israel is a God who is on your side and keeps his word. He wasn't afraid to die. He longed to be with the Lord. He was desiring that he might wake up in his glory. So there was no fear in his heart. It was more a matter of concern for the, for the glory of God. He knew that God could deliver him from death, and as a result, he would praise him for doing that. And this would demonstrate to the unbeliever that the God of Israel kept his promises. Remember that during the time that Israel would go through stress and go through hard times, very often the pagans would ask a single question. If you've read your Psalms or various portions of the Bible, you have seen this asked. The question would be asked, where is your God? They would ask that question in a mocking way. They would ask that in order that they might mock the God of Israel. Psalm 42, verse 10 uh, says, With the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? If you really had a God, in other words, why isn't your God delivering you from what you're going through right now? But God had given them assurances that He would be with them no matter what. And often He had promised to deliver them from their enemies. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, the Lord, He is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Later in Jeremiah 15, 21, God said, I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked. I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. God had promised. And so the, the pagans would say, where's your God? And God is saying, I will be with you. So David is saying, deliver me. And in doing so, you will demonstrate to the pagans that you're a God who keeps his word. It's not that he was afraid to die. It's that he wanted God to be glorified in the world. So when God delivers them, it will bring glory to the God that they serve. And it reveals that God keeps his word to his servants. And so that's what he's saying here when he says, I'll praise you. I will extol you in verse 1, Psalm 30. For you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you. You healed me. O Lord, you have brought my soul up from the grave. You have, you have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. He goes on into verse 4. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his. Give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, I want you to notice something. In verses 1 through 3, there's an individual praising, but in verse 4, he now calls the community to praise. In other words, worship and praise isn't for a single individual. It's something the community ought to be involved in, and that's what he's doing here. He's saying to them, sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his. Everybody ought to be praising the Lord. Now, David isn't praising God in a vacuum. 
So he calls on Israel to join him as he praises the Lord. Psalm 511 said, Let all those uh, rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. Now, he had been chastened. Notice verse 5, and notice how he responds. He said, His anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, this answers a question that is asked in another place when uh, the psalmist asked in Psalm 85, verse 5, will you be angry with us forever? You know, sometimes the hand of the Lord will be on us for chastening, but the question is, is God, are you ever going to let up? And the answer is yes. I want you to see this because he says his anger is but for a moment. In other words, he does let up when he chastens us, but his favor is for life. Now, for me, verse 5 has been a very important, important verse here, especially the last portion where it says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That has been very special to me over the years, especially times when we have, and I have, or my family together have suffered a loss or some kind of painful experience. This is one of those psalms, especially the last portion of verse 5, that has really carried me through quite a number of things, because weeping does endure. And, and, and by the way, in the Hebrew, the way that it's phrased, it's almost as if he's saying, I'm in bed, and next to me is weeping. Weeping is next to me all night long. It's something that I have with me all night. And it does. It endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. That, to me, is a tremendous thing. I don't want to uh, um, spend a lot of time speaking about that, but I can tell you this, that the times that we've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, the times that we have gone through things that you have to go through if you're going to be ever matured in the things of the Lord, and let's face it, if you're going to get strong, you go through things that cause you to gain strength. And as we have gone through those things individually, we have seen the Lord very faithful and one of the things that has been strong to me in my life is the knowledge that I might spend a night crying, and sometimes I have. But there's a joy that comes. There's, there's just this peace and there's this knowledge that God is in control that comes even though you might be brokenhearted when you went to bed that night. In other words, it doesn't last forever. Sometimes we may be thinking that the pain we're going through right now is going to last forever and we're going to die in that pain. Well, there's some things that you'll never forget. There are some things in your life that will probably leave a mark on you for the rest of your life until you go home to be with the Lord. There's no doubt about that. But the bottom line is, is God does take that, that sorrow and he does replace it with a peace and very often he does replace it with a joy. And that does come through, especially when you've lost somebody that was very dear to you. Because once you go through that grieving process, once you go through that mourning process, then you begin to rejoice knowing that there is a God, there is a heaven, and that loved one, if they love the Lord Jesus Christ, is with the Lord in heaven. And that causes you great joy and great satisfaction. They may not come back to you, but one day you will go to them. And that keeps you, I think that keeps you going. It keeps me going tremendously because there are those that I'm looking forward to seeing in heaven, people I love very much, and people that when they died, it caused me a great pain. But joy comes in the morning. Now, continuing in verses 6 and 7, he says, Now, in my prosperity, I said I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. David forgot that it was God who made him to stand firm. So out of pride, he thought that his prosperity was the result of his own efforts. But the Lord made it very clear to him that that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Proverbs 3.12 says, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father the son in whom he delights. Lamentations 3.22 and 23 says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. And he goes on to say, Great is your faithfulness. Lord, I thought I was doing pretty good on my own. I thought that the blessings that were in my life were coming from my own efforts, but... You made it pretty clear to me that it's through your favor that I'm able to stand. You're the one who makes my mountain strong. So I cried out to you, O Lord, verse 8, and, the Lord, and uh, to the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. So David is saying, if I would have died, it would have given God's enemies cause to mock him. So I wanted to remain alive as a visible testimony to your faithfulness and to your promises. And as a result of that, well, the dust isn't going to praise you. If I'm alive, I can. 
And that's why he says in verse 10, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me, be my helper. Then he goes on to say, You've turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. The Lord has a way of taking that which is hurtful and making it beautiful. Have you discovered that? The Lord has a way of taking that which is painful and giving to you a beauty and a joy that you wouldn't have had. How can I, how can I illustrate that? Isaiah 61 says this. In Isaiah 61, 3, God promised to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I don't know. I know you're going to get tired of this, but I'm going to use a Josiah illustration again, my grandson. I'll get, I'll get over it after a while, but, but not yet. I'm really going through a real great season with my, my, my grandson, and, um, and I can tell you, I can tell you from personal experience, I can tell you that when the announcement was made to me that I was going to be a grandfather and as much as my daughter is unmarried, I can tell you that it stabbed my heart like a knife. I can tell you that, that, and I won't go into great detail, but it was extremely painful, one of the most painful things that I have ever experienced in my life. And, um, and without undue usage of this as an illustration, my, my Marie, my wife, uh, prayed, prayed for me an awful lot and continued to do so because she knew that for me, I, I never had a, a, a sense of ever rejecting my daughter. I mean, that was, that's, you know, I, I told her from the time she was a little girl, there's nothing you can ever do in your whole life that will make me stop loving you. So stop trying so hard. You know, no, I never said that, but I said, you know, there's nothing. And that's the truth. Every parent knows what I'm saying. I mean, there's just, they're, they're your kid. You know, you may not like what they do, and it sure hurts sometimes when they make bad decisions. And you wish they wouldn't have made some of the decisions that they made. But sometimes they make decisions that they end up paying for. And so... When that decision was made and when she came and shared, my beautiful little girl told me, Daddy, I'm, I'm pregnant. I have to tell you, I, I, um, I told her when she said that, I said, I think I'm going to vomit. I'm serious. I said that. I said, I think I'm going to throw up. And she thought I was kidding, and I wasn't. It hit me so hard that I just sat there and I go, I think I'm going to throw up. This is, I can't, you know, it hurts so bad. It did. You can see it. It hurt. And you know what? I started thinking, what are we going to do for you? And how can we minister to you? There was never a, anything other than we prayed for her, held her, loved her, and said, we're here for you. You, the church, those of you who have been with us for a while and went through that with us and are aware of some of it, we're very supportive and have loved us every step of the, of the way. I've never felt any condemnation from any of you. I've never felt that any of you said, I can't go to a church where a pastor you know, I can't raise a kid. You know, I condemn myself. I went through a lot of pain. And Marie prayed, and she said, you know, Papa, she spoke to the Father, and she said, Father, may this child be a blessing to, to his grandpa. And you know what? He is. And that's that word from Isaiah that, that God gave to us when that happened, that he would give you beauty for ashes. That's exactly what has happened in our life. And I carry that little baby around with me everywhere. He hangs on to me. He clings to me. And you know what he's doing now? He doesn't know how to talk, so he just grunts. And um, I'll be holding him, and Marie will try to reach for him, and he'll look at her, and he grunts at her. He actually yells at her, or he'll, or he'll cough. You know, when he coughs, it's a way of saying, look at, you know, I'm being cared for. I'm a very sick child. Don't try and take me from Grandpa. 
And I'm wondering if when I dedicate him on Sunday, I'm wondering if I'm going to be able to hand him back to his mom because he, today he yelled at her to leave him alone because he was with Grandpa because he turns at her and, goes, and he'll yell. He'll go, ah, like that. That means hands off, man. We're having quality time, you know. <laughs> and I have to tell you, he grabs hold of my arm here and he'll grab hold of my, my collar and he hangs on for dear life. And if you try to pull him off of me, you will be pulling me with him because he buries his head in my chest and you can't get him off of Grandpa. I am in love with my Josiah. And you know the Lord does, guys, he does take that pain. And you know, no matter how deep the pain goes, God goes deeper than that pain. And he draws you up. That's what David said. You dropped the bucket down and I was near death. You dropped it down below where I was and you picked me up to you. You lifted me up. That's what the Lord does. No wonder he says, God, I praise you. No wonder he says, God, I thank you. Because, Lord, you are worthy to be praised. Because in the midst of the pain that you can go through, there is the Lord who's going to lift you up. He's going to hold you up. And no matter what, no matter when you're walking through that valley, you're never alone. That's exactly what the psalmist said. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I'm never alone. You're always with me. When Jesus was praying on one occasion, he said, and now I am alone, and yet I am not alone, for you are with me. God said, I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. And so as we look at this, this is a psalm of gratitude. He says, to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Why? You turned for me my mourning into dancing. That's why. Because he says to us, you have put off my sackcloth. Sackcloth is a symbol of mourning. You clothed me with gladness. That's why. Because what the enemy meant for evil, you turned it around and you, and you made it good, Lord. Because that's the way that you are. And that's what God does in a life. He gives beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Psalm 31, continuing... This is another psalm of David, and this is what he writes. Psalm 31, beginning at verse 1. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. So David again is crying out in this psalm for help. And it seems that so much of his life was spent in trouble and affliction. We see that in many of his psalms. And here he's crying out for God to hear him and quickly deliver him from all of his troubles. And he's saying, I need you. I need you to be my rock of refuge. I need you to be my fortress. I need you to defend me from my enemies. Verse 3, for you are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. You are my rock, he says. You are my fortress. You are my guide. You are my savior. You are my strength. And because of this, I trust in you. And I also commit myself. I commit myself into your care. Notice verse 5 where he says, Into your hand I commit my spirit. Does that ring a bell? You read that anywhere in Scripture? This is one of the things that was stated on the cross by Jesus Christ. There are um, what are called the seven last words or the seven sayings of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was on the cross, it's recorded in the different Gospels, all four, it is recorded uh, the variety of sayings, the various sayings or things that he said while he was on the cross. For example, you remember that Jesus says, uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said while he was on the cross to that thief who was being crucified next to him, who had turned to him and said to him, Remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Remember how Jesus said, I say unto you today, you shall be with me in paradise. He said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He also said, Woman, to his mother, behold your son. And to John he said, Behold your mother. He said, I thirst, and finally he said, it is finished. But he also said, uh, even as we're looking at right now, 
He's saying that he had, to his father, he committed himself into you, he said, into your hand, I commit my spirit. Basically, he's simply saying, I trust in you and I trust in your care. I have options in life to determine what I will trust in. What is it that I am going to trust in? That is the biggest question that has to be answered by every human being. Into what will you commit yourself? Who is the person or the object of your trust? You can trust a variety of things, and every one of the things that you trust can and often will let you down. From relationships to education to you name it, you can trust a variety of things, and of course we do. But we have to answer the absolute, utmost, most important question of all, into what will I commit my spirit? What will I trust the most in my life? David said, I'm going to commit my spirit to you. You are my fortress. You are my strength. You are my savior. And I will trust you. I have options today to make a decision who I'm going to trust. Some people have trusted their boyfriend or their girlfriend, and that boyfriend or girlfriend has let them down. Some people have trusted their children, and their children have let them down. Some have trusted their parents. Their parents have let them down. Some people trusted a religious leader, and the religious leader let them down. The only one that I've ever heard of that will not let you down is God. He's the only one. He's the only one who will never let you down. You know, I've said this before. I'll say it briefly now. You know, as much as I might love this church, I'm not Jesus Christ, and I will let you down. There's no doubt about it. I've heard a lot of people, and unwillingly, to be honest with you, but I have in my, in my lifetime, in my ministry, I haven't wanted to, but I have. I've disappointed a lot of people. I didn't turn out to be what they thought I was. But you know what? I'm not the Savior. There's only one who will never disappoint you, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only one who doesn't let anybody down. Now, the enemy is constantly saying that he will, and that's a lie. He'll never let you down. He will always sustain you. He'll always be with you. All I can do, and even in my wife's life, is I can have an outside influence to whatever degree she allows but Jesus Christ influences from the inside. He is in the deepest recess of her heart. He knows her thoughts. He knows her desires. He knows everything about her. All I can do is observe, and very often I'm, I'm misunderstanding because of my own sinfulness. But God knows everything in her heart. And so she needs to trust first and foremost in him. And I'm the same way. I have to trust first and foremost in the Lord, not in my friends, not in my pastor, not even in my church, not in my children, not in my parents. I need to trust first and foremost in my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I have to commit to Him my trust because He is all those things that He claims to be, everything that David is saying. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He is our guide. He is our Savior. He is our strength, and we commit ourselves to Him. And that's what David is saying here. He says in verse 6, I have hated those who regard vain idols, I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy, for you have considered my trouble. You have known my soul in adversities and have not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a wide place. In other words, he's saying here very simply, my love for you is strong, Lord, and I despise idolatry and those who would put their trust in vain things. And the reason he would be saying that is very simple. He's just making it very clear that an idol cannot deliver the person who worships that idol. That idol cannot do that because idolatry is vanity and it is useless. If you take notes, Isaiah chapter 46, verses 5 through 7, says something about idolatry. It says, To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me, that we should be alike? They lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith, and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves. Yes, they worship. They bear it on the shoulder. They carry it and set it in its place, and it stands. From its place it shall not move. Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. You can have this tree. You can cut it down. A portion of the tree you can cut into kindling, use it to cook your meal. The other portion, 
you can take it, you can overlay it with gold, you can place it on an altar, and you can begin to pray to it. And you can say to that piece of wood, save me. And the bottom line is, and this is what Isaiah is speaking about, he's saying that wood cannot move, it cannot do anything, it cannot function. You have basically made it into a god. And don't you see how ridiculous it is that with a portion of the wood you cook your meal and the other portion you worship and say, you are my god. That idol cannot save you. It's lifeless. It has no life within itself. Now, in my room, I have no idols. I better be quick to say this. But I do have a friend named Gary Ruff, and you guys know Gary. He's pastor of Calvary Chapel of the foothills. And Gary gave me a gift that I think is really funny. He gave me these little teeny little statues. I, I don't know what they're called really, but they're, they're, they're um, I, what do they call them? Well, I, I'm not sure exactly how to call them what they're called, but they're cholos is what they are. You know, have you ever seen them? What are they? They're homeboys. The homeboys. Gary, <laughs> Gary's an idiot. No, Gary, Gary knew that it would make me laugh. And so he got me a, 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 a dog, a, a Rottweiler, because my son David has one. And he got me two girls and two boys. You know, so I've got a little, I've named them, you know, you know I have like, like, like Sad Girl, and I have um, <laughs> Little Savage, you know, and, and Foxy, and, you know, and I gave them names, but they're Joseph and David and and Anna and Corinne and our dog Sam. And and I could I could put the Rottweiler right here, and if somebody came after me, I could say to the Rottweiler, bite him. <laughs> ain't, ain't, ain't gonna do anything, is it? I can say a little savage, get him. <laughs> but it's just a little savage just standing there, you know, going like this, you know. <laughs> it ain't gonna do anything. You know, and I can array him like that but they will do absolutely nothing to protect me. And, and if I thought that they would, then I'd be foolish, right? And, and that's the whole point he's making. He's saying, idols cannot defend you. They can't do anything because they're crafted by man's hands and they have no life in them. And so he says, anybody who is worshiping an idol, I despise. Why? Because they're not honoring you, God, and my heart is so for you that I can't handle the fact that some have rejected you. And these idols and those who worship idols have no respect from my heart because they have rejected the God who sets them free. Now in verse 9, continuing, he says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My, eyes, my eye wastes away with grief, yes, my soul and my body. For my life is spent with grief, my, year with, my ears with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity. My bones waste away. I am a reproach among all my, my enemies, but especially among my neighbors. And am repulsive to my acquaintances. Those who see me outside flee from me. I'm forgotten like a dead man, out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. For I hear the slander of many. Fear is on every side. While they take counsel together against me, they scheme to take away my life. Now, notice how he says, isn't this a cheery way of looking at life? I'm in trouble. I have grief. I'm physically weak. I'm wasting away. My enemies gossip. So do my neighbors. I'm deserted by my friends, I've been forgotten, I'm a broken vessel, I'm filled with anxiety, and my enemies are scheming to take away my life. This is the condition that I live in. But in verse 14, as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord. I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak insolent things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. So he's simply saying, I'm going to trust in you, Lord. Notice how he says, uh, may your face shine upon me. In other words, bestow your favor upon me, Lord, and validate my trust in you. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall, you shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Blessed 
see the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried out to you. I love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. So I want you to notice that fearing the Lord is also trusting him. And in spite of our outward circumstances, he's simply saying God works things out for our good. And I have seen that to be true in my own life. I'm certain that, that many of us in this room could say the same thing. God takes the ingredients of our life and mixes them together and produces something that's wonderful. And he has a way of doing that. He has a way of taking that which was bitter and, and mixing it together with that which is sweet and producing a blend that is absolutely incredible. God has a way of doing that. And I've discovered that sometimes when I'm going through the great times, the joyful times, that those times are actually enhanced when I'm, he, he allows me to go through the troubling times or the times of pain or the times of pressure. And all of those things have a way of working out together to produce in, in the person who believes to produce qualities that the Lord is going to use and be glorified in. Turn with me for a moment to the book of Romans chapter 5. I want to show you something there as we're about to close. Romans chapter 5. I want to remind you of something. In Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 3, Notice what the Apostle Paul writes. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 3, reading to verse 5. He says, Not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given us to us. There are things that God produces through a variety of things that we would not want. We would not want tribulation because we think that tribulation in and of itself is something too painful or affliction is too painful for us to go through. But he says there's a result and that's perseverance. And when you develop perseverance, you develop a character. When you have character, you also have hope and God pours his, his love into your life and it, that's the result of going through these things. I have choices that I make. The choices are very simple. Either I'm going to trust the Lord in everything or I'm going to try and control my own life without his help. And over time, I've discovered something very basic, and I'll close with this thought. If you want to take care of yourself, God will allow you to do that. And you'll mess yourself up pretty good over time. But if you want to have victory and you want to have joy and you want to have character, these things come by releasing your life into the hands of the one who loves you. And God has a way of taking those things that you would not necessarily want and mixing them together and producing something that is called character. And some of the greatest people who have great character have been the ones who've gone through the most pain. They're the ones who've been tried in the furnace of affliction, and they're the ones who have come out shining like gold. And that's what the Lord wants to do in our life. And what, what the result will be is that we will simply say, blessed be the name of the Lord because he has shown us his marvelous kindness. And that's what happens, guys, when you walk with the Lord. You go through a variety of things, but at the end, you're going to turn around and say, you know what? It was all worth it. It was all worth it. Everything that we've gone through has been worth it. Finally, you know, in, in my own marriage with my, my Marie, We've gone through a lot of things together, a lot of joys and a lot of sorrows. But it's all worth it. It's all been worth it. Because everything that we've endured and enjoyed together has produced in me a character that has been refined through those things. And I've seen that in the Lord. I've seen that God has a way of taking whatever it is that we go through. And we might not have asked for that and wouldn't have desired it. And if the Lord would have said to us, oh, by the way, now that you're saved and you're happy and you're crying because you're going to heaven, well, you're going to live 29 and a half years 
and then I'm going to take you home. But in those 29 and a half years, you're going to go through this, you're going to go through this, you're going to go through this. Oh, by the way, you're going to go through this too. You're going to have these losses, these pains, this kind of suffering. Does he do that? No. All he says is, look at now that you're with me, you're going to learn to trust me over the next 29 and a half years, and I will show you my goodness, and I will eventually take you home to be with me. And everything that you go through is going to work together for your good. And then he can simply say, do you believe that? And me, I say, yes, Lord, I do. I do believe that. I know that no matter what I go through, I'm never alone, and it works out for my good, and you will produce joy in my life because you've been with me every step of the way. And so, Lord, let's go. Let's do what you want because I want to be what you want me to be. And you are the master of my life. I'm your slave. Just take me where you want. Work with me as you will and produce the fruit that you desire. And I will rejoice in you.